worship and praise our Lord and Savior again one more time. So if you would just join with us as we sing, Res the Power. Go ahead and clap your hands right where you are. Oh, he's 
Father, Lord, we thank you and we praise you again, Lord God, because you have still, you are still faithful in all that you do and all that you are, God. And we worship you and we praise your holy name because we know that there's no one like you. God, we lift up your name on high because you are worthy to be praised in this place, oh God. And Lord, we ask that you would just meet us here, allow your presence to fall wherever we are, oh God, so that we can worship you in spirit and in truth. We bless you, we honor you, we glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we know that so many things are going on that we may not even understand. And we thought we might be past this at this point, but we know if our God has already taken care of us before, he's been faithful before, he can do it again. Amen.
It's me, Chris Clemens, the pastor of the Way of Life Church. And yes, it's really me. I know I look drastically different uh, from the previous videos you may have watched. And the reason why is I've been able to escape the island. Listen, Wilson and, I, Wilson and I made a raft and we got on the water. Listen, I got separated from Wilson and couldn't bring Wilson with me. Wilson! I'm sorry. Some of you get the reference that's from the movie Cast Away. If, okay, well, never mind. Well, anyway, I was able to get my hair cut. And listen, don't hate, just congratulate. Uh, I did not go to the barber shop. The barber came to me. So I want to thank Tyree for stopping by and hooking me up. Not only do I thank you, but my wife really thanks you. She is very, she says thank you. So thank you. Uh, I want to wish you a happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. Uh, I thank uh, my wife. My wife, Tracy, is a wonderful mother. I thank my mom, uh, Gwen, my mother-in-law. If you are a mother, listen, thank you for your love, for your sacrifice. Uh, I know some of you, you have a mother in heaven. And I can't say happy Mother's Day. And the reason why, because she can't be any happier if she's in heaven. So I'm going to wish you a happy son, happy daughter, happy grandchild day, so that you can be comforted by the happiness she has right now in heaven. And that you have a wonderful example of love to try to follow with someone else. Well, we're in this series called From Discouraged to Encouraged. And I am super excited about the good news that I'll be sharing with you today. If you're a person who's been in a difficult place in your life and, and you're in a difficult place, not because you were doing the wrong things, but when you were trying to pursue the right things and it seems like wave after wave of, of bad things happen to you, I want you to know you have a word from God today. If you're excited about that, listen, give me an I can't wait in the comment section right now. Just type I can't wait right now. Give me a heart, a happy face, a like or something in anticipation of God's word. If this is your first, second or third time watching one of our videos, I want to thank you for taking the time out right now. Uh, I would love for you to like our page or subscribe to our channel on YouTube. Uh, you can venture over to our website, thewayoflifechurch.com uh, and learn more about us. You can also be connected with us through an app. Go to your app store and download our app and be connected with us outside of this moment. I want to thank you all for your prayers, your well wishing, your support. It has truly been a blessing. Well, let's go to God in prayer right now as we prepare to go into God's word. Father God, I thank you right now, Lord, for blessing us with this moment, this opportunity to hear from your word and to learn your truth and how it applies to us, especially when we're in difficult places. I'm praying, Lord, for the person right now watching um, that you would speak to their heart, that you would give them comfort and strengthen them right now through your word. Prepare our minds, help us to be patient and to be vigilant in your word as we learn your truth, that we would be transformed and that we would not only be transformed for what happens within us, but that we might transform the world about us. Thank you so much for your word. It's in Jesus name we pray. Amen. 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 
Uh, I was listening to my daughter talk about this year. You know, if you think back at the beginning of the year, this year, if you're a person that went to church, maybe you went uh, the first Sunday in January, I'm pretty sure your pastor talked about a theme for the year. Maybe they had vision as the thing, right? 2020, vision. And I can tell you for a fact, no one envisioned what we have happening in 2020. You know, for many people, it goes all the way back to that helicopter crash with Kobe and Gigi. Just kind of started off wrong in January. And then we had the whole pandemic. In the U.S., there's been over a million people infected. 70,000 people have died from this virus. Think about that. That's a football stadium of people who are no longer here because of that virus. Our unemployment rate was around 3.5%. Now there's some estimates that say that unemployment may be as high as 20%. We saw the price of oil per uh, barrel of oil go negative, right? Never heard of that. We had it go low, but it went negative. And on top of that, now there's this whole, what, murder hornet? You, you, have you seen anything about this murder hornet? It's like, what else can happen? And now we're at the beginning of May. So, you know, if there are aliens or zombies in June, we're like, okay, yeah, what else? And, and it's been a bad year, seems like, all of this stuff happening. And some of you will say, you know what, I'm used to bad years. I've had bad years before 2020. Matter of fact, 2020 is no worse than 2019 or 2018. And what makes it seem so difficult for a person of faith, and maybe even for you to maintain your faith, is that all these bad things happen when it seems like you're trying to do the right thing. It wasn't until you started praying uh, that you started having problems. When you started praying, that's when your marriage started falling apart. When you sought counseling, that's when your spouse decided to leave you. Uh, when you started giving to the church, that's when you lost your job. And no matter what you try to do to get a job, you seem to always find yourself losing and needing another job. And it's just frustrating. And you can get to the place where it says, you know, I, I know you guys talk about praying and just holding on. But listen, God's not doing that with me. And all these preacher sermons and things that talk about how I need to just kind of keep my head up and look for God. Look, and it, it's I've been here for a long enough time to know God's not looking at me. And here's what I want you to know uh, from today's discussion. That no matter how bad things get and for however long they may be. You are not forgotten. That's the title of our discussion today. You are not forgotten. I want you to say that to your neighbor through the comment section right now. You are not forgotten. Now, here's how we're going to learn that we're not forgotten. We're going to look at a passage, and it's a kind of lengthy portion of Scripture. I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 40. And we're going to be looking at a large portion from verse 9 all the way to verse 23. Now let me give us a little context. This is about a person named Joseph. Joseph was a dreamer. And, and when he was 17 years old, he's out there with his other brothers and he has a vision that has his brothers bowing down to him. Now listen, his brothers already didn't like him because he was, he was their father's favorite. And when he communicates this vision about them buying down to him, they hated him even worse. Had a second vision, same thing, not just his brothers, but his mother and his father, everybody bowing down to him. And they hated him. And they hated him so much, they actually plotted to kill him. But instead of killing him, they ended up selling him into slavery to some traders who were going by. And those traders took him to Egypt. And then he found himself under a, a royal official's household. A guy named Potiphar was his master now. This teenager now had a master. But God blessed him. And so the master put him over everything. And so things were a little bit better. Things are seeming to look up. But then that master's wife had eyes for him. And when he decided to do the right thing, it didn't seem like God blessed him. And what turned out to happen, she falsely accused him of trying to assault her. And so the master, Potiphar, threw him into prison. And so now, this young man, who always tried to do the right thing, finds himself in prison. And while he's in prison, in Egypt, two officials are also thrown in, into the, the prison cell with him. 
One is a cupbearer for, for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and the other is a baker. And, and the jailer puts Joseph over everything in the jail, and he wants him to, say, to serve these special inmates, this baker and this cupbearer. And they have this dream, and they're troubled by this dream, and, and they share this dream uh, uh, with Joseph. And Joseph said, well, you know, who interprets dreams but God? Share them with me, and maybe I can help you out. And so that brings us to verse 9, Genesis chapter 40, starting at verse 9. It says, so the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, in my dream, there was a vine before me. And on the vine, there were three branches. As soon as it budded, its blossoms shot forth and the clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, this is its interpretation. The three branches are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office. And you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly when you were his cupbearer. Only remember me when it is well with you. And please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh. And so get me out of this house. For I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews. And, and here also I have done nothing that should put me into the pit. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was favorable, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream. There were three cake baskets on my head. And in the uppermost basket, there were all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh. But the birds were eating it out of the basket on my head. And Joseph answered and said, this is its interpretation. The three baskets are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and hang you on a tree. And the birds will eat the flesh from you. On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all his servants and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to him. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Right? And that's how the chapter ends. It just kind of echoes. Can you imagine how Joseph felt? He did what he believed God wanted him to do. He interpreted these dreams accurately. And he, his only request to the cupbearer was, remember me, right? I, I want to get out. I want to be set free. Just mention me to Pharaoh. And he kind of gives them some comfort. Listen, you're not setting a guilty person free. I'm innocent. I've done nothing wrong. So you'd be doing the right thing just by mentioning me. And what does the cupbearer do? He forgets him, right? Out of sight, out of mind. And I, and I understand the feeling of being in a place for a long time. It lets us know that this doesn't just linger for a couple of days or weeks. You can think about the party, the birthday party was three days after they left the cell. So you can imagine Joseph counting the days, right? This thing is going to come true. In four days, they're going to come back and come get me. And nobody shows up. Five days, they're going to come back. Okay, it's been a week now. All right, surely this month. God, God, I, I'm in this place and I, I haven't done anything wrong. I've done the right things and I keep finding myself in pits. My brothers threw me in a pit and, and now I'm in a pit here in Egypt and I'm not getting out and I'm forgotten. And it's real easy when you're in that place, especially for a long time, to think that it's not only people have forgotten you, but maybe God has forgotten you. And I want you to know God has not forgotten you but he has done something with you. Here's the first thing I want you to know that he has done or is doing with you to encourage you. He has positioned you. Positioned you, you are positioned. What do you mean I'm positioned? Positioned for what? You're positioned for your growth, for your development. You see, in each place, Joseph, got a new responsibility. He learned some things that he wouldn't have otherwise have known. He learned how to manage people in Potiphar's house. He wouldn't have learned that back home with his brothers. He was one of the youngest. 
And so they would have always been managing him. But he was put in a position where he had to manage other people. And throughout the chapters before we get to chapter 40, as a matter of fact, all through, uh, I want to say it's chapter 38, it talks about how the Lord was with Joseph, either 38 or 39. The Lord, eight times it talks about the Lord was with Joseph. How he found favor with people. He started out with favor. He had favor in his father's eyes. And he had fought favor in Potiphar's eyes. And even in the jail cell, he had favor in the jailer's eyes. To the point that people put him in charge of all sorts of things. And it developed this young man into a leader. And God allows us to be in difficult places to grow us to develop us. An example of this is with the people of Israel. When they went through what they went through in the Exodus, you think about all the things they went through to being hungry, being thirsty, and, and having to fight battles and all of these trials that happen. And he's like, God, when you're encountering these things, why do I keep having all of these difficulties? Why can't I have it a little bit easier? And it's so that you can learn something you wouldn't otherwise know. Right? You don't grow. You're not going to be more educated by studying what you already know. And that's what he told the Israelites. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 2 through 3, he says, And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Listen, you would not have learned that if you had your own food, if you were able to supply your own needs. But when you're in a place of hunger and I spoke, you understand that you're fed by my word. We learn things in these difficult places we wouldn't otherwise know. We grow in ways in which we wouldn't otherwise grow in these difficult places. New Testament, James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. He says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials. Uh, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and steadfastness will have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Right. Says you are incomplete without the trials, without the difficulties. You won't be steadfast. You won't be patient. Your faith will be weak. Listen, you don't get stronger by picking up paper clay, paper clips get stronger by picking up what's heavy, what's difficult. So you are positioned for your growth, but you're also positioned for his glory. I hope this is encouraging somebody right now, because here's what I want you to understand. A lot of times when this is preached, people look at the heights by which Joseph was able to continue, right? He went from Potiphar's house uh, ultimately to the throne of Pharaoh, second in command. And we think about how it's about being bigger and, and getting more authority. And we're thinking about us. Many times it's taught that way, but that's not what Joseph focused on. See, what I want you to pick up on in every place he represented his faith as a slave. He was the best slave he could be. As a, as a prisoner, falsely imprisoned, innocent, he was one that shared his gift with those around him. That was concerned and compassionate for others being discouraged from whatever was happening, from dreams. And he was responsible. See, he was a person of light. Even in those dark places, he pointed to the goodness of God. And we are to be children of light. That's what Jesus said. We ought to be children of light. And he says, nobody puts a light under a basket. No, they put it on a lampstand. They position it on a lampstand so that it gives light to everyone in the room, everyone in the house, right? The light is not for it to shine for itself. 
It's to help others to see. That's what I used to miss uh, in the story about the man born blind. There was a man born blind. And, and, and Jesus and his disciples, they were passing by and his disciples asked, well, who sinned? Right. Why is he in this condition? Was it him or was it his parents before? And what does Jesus say? He says it's neither one. He said this man was born blind so that the glory of God might be seen in him, that it might be shown through him. And I used to didn't get that, right? That seemed cruel. God, he was born blind. He suffered for 20, 30 years just to have this moment in which Jesus would heal him and I would miss it. Because, right, what did Jesus say? Why? So that the glory of God might be seen, right? This man couldn't physically see for a number of years but he would be used so that everybody could see the glory of God. Now that's worth that short time of suffering, that short time of difficulty. If God would use that short time to bless people for a long time, to see something more important than, than what that man could have seen on earth, that's worth it. That's about the blessing of God. And God has positioned you as a child of light to shine the light of his glory so they would see just how good he is. You know, in the previous video, I, I, I recorded the video outside and I'm back in the office. And you may think, man, it looks a little weird, right? It's, it's not as bright as it is because it's nighttime. And, and one of the things I wanted you to pick up on, I did that on purpose. I recorded this at night and I wanted you to see this little light I have. Here's a little light that I use. See that little light? Now, while it was shining, you probably had no idea that light was there. Why? Because there's another light shining above. But when I turn that light off, man, look how you can still see me. You can still see me. I'm, I'm gonna turn this light off for a second. Let's see how dark it gets. Wow! Now, when that light was on, you didn't know the power of that light. But in the darkness, oh man, this small light has a bit of power. This small light has great power and helps you to see what you wouldn't normally be able to see. And that's why God has positioned you where he has positioned you. You say, well, wait a minute. My spouse left, on, left and walked out on me. Maybe your children need to see divine grace in you. They wouldn't be able to be able to see it in the relationship that you desire, but they get a chance to see it in how you deal with this difficulty in your life. Maybe somebody needs to see what faith looks like and how God can provide when you don't have that big high paying job that you once had. God has made you a child of light and in the dark places he has positioned you so that light can shine brighter, that others can see just how good he is. God has positioned you but he hasn't just positioned you. It's, getting, it's gonna get even better. He has appointed you. I, I want you to think about that for a moment. I want you to understand that it's not just about you suffering and that's it, that would be good in the grand scheme of things. But God is a rewarder of those who have faith, those who earnestly seek him. And I want you to know that as a child of faith, you're appointed for blessings. You're appointed for a reward. Now, where do we see that in the passage? Matter of fact, it's actually not in those verses, but it gives us a preview, right? When we got to the end of chapter 40, it says that he was forgotten. But if we look at the next chapter, the very first verse of the next chapter, it says, after two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. Why does that excite me? It excites me because I know the story. You see, at the end of chapter 40, it seems like he's forgotten. But God had another dream appointed. And this dream happened with Pharaoh. And Pharaoh would have his dream interpreted by who? Not the cupbearer, but the dream reminded the cupbearer that there was a person back in jail that could interpret Pharaoh's dream.
Oh, is that a coincidence? I think not. And when Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dream, then he knows the grand scheme that God has planned for there to be seven years of plenty. And then following those seven years, there's going to be seven years of famine. And if they don't have the right person in place, everyone's going to starve. And so what does Pharaoh say? Pharaoh says, well, listen, you must be the right person. And he puts him in charge. And everyone is blessed by the person who was thrown away, the person who was lied on, the person who was forgotten by people, but not by God. God loves to have appointments. If you read the book of Jonah, it is filled with appointments. Jonah, right, the person who was saved by the fish, swallowed by the fish. If you read Jonah, it says God appointed a fish. He was thrown overboard, but God had already had an appointment to rescue him. When he found himself on land with the people he didn't want to prophesy to, God had said, it says that God had appointed a, a, a tree to go up, a plant to go up to give him shade. And God had appointed a worm to eat the root so that, that Jonah would learn a lesson of who he should be compassionate about. There are appointments in God's word for God's people. R Romans 5, 6 says that while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. There is an appointment for b God's blessing on your life. Are you saying that because I lost my job, God has appointed a greater blessing in another job? I'm not saying that. Are you saying that when I got sick, it's because I'm gonna come out stronger? Am I appointed for that? I can't tell you that. All I can tell you is that the people of faith always end on a high note. If you go through the whole Bible, the people of faith never end on a low note. It doesn't end at chapter 4, 40, for Joseph. There's always a high point for the people of faith. And so if you are a person in Christ Jesus, I want you to know there is a high point. I don't care where you are. You may say, okay, well, but I still want what I want. I still want my job, or I still want this relationship. And he might give you that. But I want you to understand that what Joseph wanted in his deepest despair, in his darkest place, wasn't as good as what God wanted. Well, what do you mean? I want you to process this for a moment. When he was in prison, what would Joseph want? He want to be set free. And maybe he'd want to go back home to his family be with those who loved him. And he would have felt great. He would have celebrated and worshiped God. Thank you for hearing my prayers. Thank you for setting me free. But what would have happened in, after seven years? There would have been a famine, the same famine that God had already planned to come. But they would not have been a person who would have set aside provisions to get people through the famine. And so everybody would have died. So there would have been a short time blessing and a long time a permanent difficulty if it had gone the way that Joseph would have wanted it. But God's plan is always better. His blessings are always better. So I don't have to know what all is going to happen in my appointment. All I have to do is trust God that I am appointed. Oh man, I hope you, I'm hoping you're encouraged. I'm sweating because listen, this is exciting. To me, wherever you are, I don't care how long it's been, I want you to resolve yourself to represent God where you are and to trust that he is appointed a blessing for you. At the end of the chapter, at the end, of, excuse me, of the book of Genesis, in chapter 50, right? We just touched on a little bit of chapter 41. When the brothers come back, and after their father has died and they're wondering if Joseph is gonna turn on them, if he's gonna bring justice on them. What, what does Joseph say? Verse 20, as for you, you meant it for evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about the many people, excuse me, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. I want you to see what happened. That God's good wasn't just for Joseph. It was for everybody. And I want you to understand why I can be so encouraged with this story, why I love and I'm excited about this story. And I know how God's always going to bless me, even in the most difficult places. It's because I know where I am in this story in Genesis. 
right? I have the example of faith that I see in Joseph, but I'm not Joseph in the story. What do you mean I'm not Joseph? Because I'm not the innocent person. I, I'm not the person who deserves to be free. I'm not the person who deserves to be exalted. Now, where I find myself in the story of Joseph, I, I'm one of the brothers that wanted to reject the one who was promised to be worshiped. I, I, I'm like one of the ones, I'm, 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 I'm more like Potiphar's wife who might lie and be deceptive when it comes to the one who would sit on the throne. I think y'all understand where I'm going with this. If I would identify myself in the story, I might be like the cupbearer, one who benefited from the faithfulness of one, but ultimately forgot all about him, lived as if he didn't exist. But because he made it to the throne, because God positioned him Everybody was blessed. Everybody was saved. And so I'm the brothers that see that God meant it for good. I, I'm the cupbearer to see that even in my forgetfulness, God meant it for good. And so if God would do these things for me when I have forgotten, when I wasn't following, when I wasn't faithful, as I says it in Romans 5.10, listen, he reconciled us while we were still sinners. How much more now so that we have been reconciled shall we be saved by the life of Jesus Christ? If, he, if I was worth dying for when I was a deceiver, when I was a murderer and a liar, how much more can I trust God to bless me that I'm his son? See, ladies and gentlemen, when you're in that dark place, when you're in that difficult place and you've been there a long time and it feels like faith isn't working, I want you to keep holding on to your faith. You are positioned and you are appointed. I, 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 I let you know I'm Pastor Clemens. I'm Pastor Clemens, pastor of the Way of Life Church. But I started off at a church called Monero Baptist Church. I was a youth minister, a volunteer youth minister, and I wanted to be a full-time youth minister there. And I sent this letter. I want to be a full-time youth minister at part-time pay. I just enrolled in seminary and I just wanted to serve God. And the church said no. And it devastated me. God, I prayed about this. Why wouldn't you bless me to come into this position? But God says, I have something else planned for you. And God would have me become the youth pastor over at the Good Hope Missionary Baptist Church. I came under the mentorship of the pastor there, Dr. D.C. Cofield. But God would put it on my heart while I'm over there. Well, I, I want to be a pastor, God. I want to shepherd your people. I want to lead you, lead them and, and encourage them in the way in which I feel like you've encouraged me. And you put this on my heart. And so I started applying to churches that were looking for pastors. Here's a, their churches, they don't have a pastor. And here's a pastor that wanted a church. And I would send out applications. Uh, one of them I sent out to was Calvary Baptist Church, Glenwood, Illinois. They had me in the top three candidates, and I hadn't even visited a church. And then all of a sudden, I get this letter. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to consider you for the pastor of the Calvary Baptist Church. And after careful and prayerful review of your resume, we have determined that we're not able to offer you to this position. You know how these stories go. I even applied to my own church back at, in Acres Home, Mount Air Baptist Church, and I got the same letter. Later on, I figured, okay, wait, maybe it wasn't that church. Maybe it's another church, Grace First Baptist Church in San Antonio. The committee would like to thank you for submitting your resume, but after prayerful consideration, you know how the rest of it goes. There was even another church, Riceville, Mount Olive Baptist Church. We reviewed their, your resume and appreciative of where we are of your willingness to be involved. However, after prayer and careful consideration, another church was Blessed Hope Missionary Baptist Church. I think I might have made to top three there. Pastor Search Committee of Blessed Hope would like to inform you that we have thank you, thankful for your application, but after careful prayer and consideration. Now all the time, I'm there and I'm wondering, God, why are if you're putting this desire in my heart, 
Why aren't you delivering me to be able to fulfill the desire? And what I was missing was all the development I was getting at, my, at, at Good Hope uh, Missionary Baptist Church. I started off as youth minister and I went on to the, 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 be the director of discipleship, maturity. And then I, had be, I went on to be the director of the membership and, and facilitating missions and hiring more staff. And, and, and all this development, I was over children and worship at one point in time, and I can't sing a lick. But God was developing me. And then, <laughs> when I had stopped applying to churches and saying, I guess it's just not God's will, He tweaked the desire in my heart and said, The church that I wanted you to pastor doesn't exist yet, but it's going to exist. And, and I had a meeting in 2016. This is, this is the handout. In May 21st, 2016, almost four years ago, it says, do you want to plant a church? And that's a picture of the tower at the Pearland Town Center. And there were 34 people who went forth and were blessed by the pastor, D Dr. D.C. Cofield of the Good Hope Missionary Baptist Church to go with me to plant this church. And of those 34 adults, uh, 32, excuse me, 30 are still with us. 30 out of the 34. And now there's a hundred and I want to say uh, 24 of us now as far as members. And even through this pandemic, we're still here. We're still growing, still loving. Here's my point. God had positioned me. Even though there was a different desire in my heart, but he positioned me to develop and to bring him glory until the appointed time where he would call me to a different place of blessing. What he did for me, he'll do even more for you. Be faithful. Praise God. Listen, I want you to understand how you can be that person of faith for anybody who's watching. If you have put your faith in Christ Jesus, you have all those promises. But if you have yet to put your faith in Christ Jesus, that's the first blessing you need to know. Let me help you do that. I want you to pray with me if this speaks to your heart. God, I'm a sinner. And I need you to forgive me for my sins. I believe that you sent Jesus, your son, to die for my sins and to live again that I might live with him. And so I surrender my life right now to Jesus Christ. I make him my Lord and my master. And it's my desire to serve you with my whole life. Thank you for saving me. If you prayed that prayer, ladies and gentlemen, you are a child of God. You are a new creature. And that new creature, even though you may be in the same spot you are in, have a new outlook. You are positioned for your growth, for his glory, and appointed for blessing. Hope you have a wonderful Mother's Day. Lord willing, see you next Sunday.